A, B, C. A always, B, B, C closing. Always be closing. Episode two in the books, finally. Um, uh, Roy and I couldn't wait to get uh, to get on this podcast. Uh, we have with us retired SEAC, uh, John Wayne Troxel. Did I pronounce that right? Absolutely. All right. Um, so uh, he is an Army veteran. Um, he obviously held the highest position for the enlisted in the United States military. I think it's, what, 37 years in the military, right? 37 years, 10 months, and 29 days. But who was counting, right? Yeah, man, I can't. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm almost at 14. I'm like, can I do another thing? <laughs> Am I going to make it that long? So, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. But, um, yeah, if you want to kind of just talk about yourself, sir, um, you know, like a little brief history just so our viewers can get to know you a little bit, and then we'll dive right in. Yeah. Well, first of all, to Cameron, to you and Roy, thank you both for doing this. Um, I really, when I see uh, two individuals like you that have a vision and you put a project together and you're getting out and getting after it, that tells me that, uh, you know, the folks that we have serving and everything, I call it our greatest competitive advantage is the men and women that serve, that know how to get after business. So first and foremost, thank you both for having me. Um, so as Cameron said, my name is John Wayne Troxel. Just retired after one month shy of 38 years of active duty. Uh, finished off. <laughs> finished off. <laughs> That's a number. <laughs> it just means I'm old, all right? But I can, get, I can still get up and get after it. Now, Experienced. All right? but, yeah. but, uh, so I'm, I, I spent uh, all my time in the Army, the last 20 years of my career as a Command Sergeant Major or the SEAC, in the last four years working for the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Secretary of Defense, as the SEAC, when my responsibilities were to gain the pulse of the force for the chairman, secretary, and the administration uh, on how the troops are doing uh, and what we need to do to make sure the troops globally could do their mission. Um, I joined in 1982 right out of high school and just retired. So from 18 years old to 56 years old, all I've known is the United States military. And uh, I'm married uh, to my wife uh, 37 years. I have three adult sons and four grandchildren. And Hit me with yeah. these numbers, man. <laughs> Got to get our abacus out, right? So we can start counting this stuff, right? Nice. But uh, what I do now is uh, I open my own consulting company and I consult for seven different organizations okay. uh, to include a movie production company in Hollywood, but several veteran and military support organizations I sit on boards that get after the epidemic of veteran suicide and trying to eliminate that, but also uh, assisting transitioning service members to get employment so that they have the same purpose and direction they had when uh, they were serving in uniform. Mm -hmm. And so I stay pretty busy right now, but I still have plenty of time to spend with my grandchildren. So again, honor to be here, gentlemen. Yeah. And you, uh, <laughs> you run the, the Ron and John show, right? Yes, I do. I'm the co-host there you go. I was, I was checking that out. I like I like it. <laughs> How do you know yeah. Ron? Uh, so here, this is an interesting story. So I got ready to retire, and I needed to buy a house out here in the Joint Base Lewis McCord area. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> a friend of mine uh, who is, uh, lives out here, she introduced me to a realtor who introduced me to Veterans Lending Group. And Mike and Brooke Milano, the national directors of Veterans Lending Group, mm -hmm. that does VA home loans. And, and so I bought my house through them. Well, one day they asked to take, uh, take me and my wife to lunch. And they asked me, what are your thoughts about becoming our brand ambassador? Yeah. Meaning, you know, you know, support their organization. I said, hey, you're supporting veterans. They're, they, are, they only hire veterans to work as home loan officers for military families. Mm -hmm. And so I said, yes. And so they introduced me to Ron, who's an Army veteran and a former second ranger battalion guy and we just hit it off and uh, so then we thought about how do we continue to broaden the brand and market the brand yeah. and uh, we thought of this you know kind of like you guys are doing <laughs> although our name isn't as eloquent as your guys I love it <laughs> it is the absolute scared money don't make money I love it <laughs> you know and so we just started the Ron and John show there and we started taking it on the road we went to Fairchild Air Force Base okay. before COVID shutdown happened. Yeah. And we spent time with nice. the 92nd wing out there and, and the airmen and everything. Mm -hmm. 
We're heading to Goodfellow Air Force Base in August. Oh, man, Goodfellow. <laughs> we'll do a live Ron and John show from there. And so, yeah, I enjoy being the co-host. And now because of, you know, what the coronavirus does and yeah. people being forced to stay at home a lot more. Yep. In the month of August, we are going to focus on health, wellness, and fitness. Okay. And so I've reached out and I've got five guests throughout the month uh, that are big in the fitness industry and are also, some of them are former veterans, like Chef Andre Rush, okay. White House Chef. If you ever seen him, he's yeah. probably got the largest arms on the planet. Oh, man. that yeah, 24 inch mm-hmm. biceps. Uh, <laughs> UFC Hall of Famer Pat Militich. Uh, okay. NASCAR truck uh, circuit driver Jesse Ruji, who's okay. a uh, Navy veteran. And oh, then yeah. I got uh, then I got Dan Solomon, who runs Muscle and Fitness in the Mr. Olympia weekend. And then uh, Iron Mike Stedman, Marine vet, and runs Iron Bound Boxing USA. So all through the month of August, we're going to get after some fitness. And oh, by the way, I'm going to do Zoom PT sessions every week. Oh, so if man. you guys want to get scuffed up a little bit, feel free to join me, all right? Uh, I need to jump in. On yeah, that. he's well, Roy's in my Roy's in Miami, so you know he's got to start. He's got to start for next year's beach bod. Yeah, <laughs> next, say, next year's. Hey Miami, you got to be all buff and stuff all the time, man. You know you, you do, you do. <laughs> like you, like so. I'm not gonna lie. So I come from a recruiting background, so I I got to walk around with confidence. But you just walking around, you sure. just like hold on, bro, like. I, I'm not even close let me, to... Let me pick this pen up. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, hey, I, I, I bet you the can't push nobody. Way, right? okay. Exactly. Okay. Like, man. <laughs> like, yo, I'm just, I just be like, man, I, my pectorals or pectoralis uh, just isn't on the Miami 305 level just yet. But yeah, give me give me about a year and a half. I With your PT session, I, I get there. I get Hell yeah, absolutely. I'll be proud of you. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, man. But I honestly, I cannot. Whew, 38 years. Yeah, well, good. you know, so the other thing that I kind of focused on the last 15 years is kind of my uh, my little acronym I use called PME HAR, meaning in uniform we got we got to have people that are physically, mentally, and emotionally hard, not just tough, but hard, meaning the exact opposite of soft and not easily penetrable. And yeah. I don't care what we do in the military over the body of a career, whatever you're doing, even as a recruiter, if we are not looking out for our health, and Roy, you said it best, in order to make the military marketable to men and women, uh, we better be marketable ourselves. Yeah. And, you know, and you yep. know, you've got to be that person that shows every one of you guys, and both of you have been recruiters, if we can't put you on that poster, that of what an airman, a soldier, a sailor, a marine is supposed to look at like, yep. then we probably got some challenge. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> so uh, PME hard. And now I, the thing I do once a week, I, I call it hashtag get with the movement. Just get out and do something. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I see too many veterans that they get out, they let themselves go physically. And if they've had challenges in the behavioral health arena or they have PTSD, once the physical part starts to go mentally and emotionally, it becomes a strain. And then if you throw in any kind of relationship or financial burdens yeah. in there, it can further take them down a road where all of a sudden, uh, and then if you include alcohol or drugs or firearms in there, Compound. pretty soon they could be yep. on a road that they can't return. So it all starts with just taking care of our health. And it doesn't mean you have to get out and, and do some crazy PT. It could be just walking every day yep. to get yep. out and get your heart rate up a little bit and uh, enjoy life. For sure. You, for sure. I mean, when you said that, like, just get out and walk. It, like, I remember growing up, like, my grandmother, my grandmother has never had a driver's license, ever. She yeah. walked <laughs> everywhere. And she had the worst diet. She'd be like, baby, like, let's go to McDonald's. I'm going to get a Big Mac and some fries. I'm like, but I'm like. I'm going to walk you, home while I eat it. Yeah. Like, How are you like so smart? But like if she wasn't riding in the car with like with my parents or a family friend or anybody like that, she was always walking. She was catching the bus. And yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I didn't realize that she and she didn't work out, but that was a form of exercise. And I mean. And she still kicked, like, she still cusses me out to this day. Like, and well, you look I, at I can the, honestly... 
Yeah. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So every time of, of fitness, okay, that isn't generally driven by a traditional strength and conditioning or cardio. So think about how many permanent change of station moves you might have done. And think yeah. about the men and women that show up to pack up your household goods and everything. I will tell you, the guys that uh, dropped off my uh, last shipment here when I retired, none of those guys looked like they were coming out of a gym, but they were some of the strongest mm-hmm. guys I have ever seen. And uh, and they were eating like crap, you know. So I bought them lunch. I said, what do you guys want for lunch? Well, get us McDonald's, you know, or whatever. <laughs> but them dudes, I would not want to have met any of those guys in a dark alley because they – understood explosiveness strength yep. and they yeah, had cardio yeah. about them too because they had to offload 18,000 pounds worth of stuff into my house <laughs> and they did it in the space of like five hours yeah. and i'm talking about putting the furniture together and all that kind of stuff carrying stuff up three flights of stairs i mean they were yeah so the point being is just get out and do something yeah you know, yeah uh, to look out for our health because there's nothing more important to us than our health for sure most, most definitely, because uh, I know um, I just did like a little brief the other day and I was explaining to like new recruiters that's coming on board. Like, hey, sometimes the simplest appreciation of just being able to wake up in the morning um, and then walk to your refrigerator. Some, sometimes that's the pep that you need right there. Yeah. The, the yeah. Appreciation of, I mean, shoot, just life. And Absolutely. Sometimes, especially for military members sometimes we can get so comfortable because truth be told the military life isn't a bad life and we get so comfortable in that depending on where you come from if you get back if you get knocked back to it like whoa i forgot (laughs) i came from this like you like that reality check like you gotta you gotta still take into account the perspective perspective. and appreciation yeah name of the game perspective so what um so I would say, like, as you as you progress in your career um, and even now, like, you know, now that you're retired, like what what things do you really kind of hold on to or do you strive to be better at when it comes to like your knowledge base? Like, what are you, yeah. you know, because like, obviously you were wonderful at being in the military. How are you? How are you at being a civilian, like owning your own company? Like, you know, things like yeah. that. So one thing I was always focused on and and it's important is that. In the military, you have to be a learning leader at all times. Yeah. Meaning every day you got to look to get better. As we've talked, physically, mentally, and emotionally, but all professionally, technically, and tactically as well, you got to continue to grow and develop. And the more you get gain and rank, like I did, a lot of my learning was happening to people that were subordinate to me. Mm-hmm. That, that people that I outrank. And you have, as a leader, you have to have that humility to say, I might be the senior guy in what I'm doing, but I'm not the smartest guy right now So or gal. So I need to go and see Cameron or Roy who may know this task better than me, and I need to learn from them. Sometimes leaders get too caught up. I call it lost in their own museum where they've done all these things and they turn off the learning. And once you become that, you can become irrelevant in a hurry. And pretty yeah, soon, for sure. people don't want to come and talk to you because you're not providing inspiration, purpose, motivation, direction. I'll tell you the other thing here, which is why I love the, the title of your show. So as I was getting ready to retire, and I went through my transition course, and I was exposed to corporate America, I thought, man, I can get out here and do some things. You know, yeah. I, and it, it actually kind of uh, re-energized me that I wanted to go out and do great things. And being an enlisted guy, you know, as I got down to the end, too many times general officers or flag officers would come out to me and say, oh, you're getting ready to retire, so yeah, what are you going to do? You're going to go work at Lowe's? Are you going to get a GS job on base or work at range control? <laughs> and they, they were innocent enough questions. Why are my job right options up. Lowe's? <laughs> yeah, you know, but and don't get me wrong. Those jobs are honorable. If anybody's mm-hmm. doing those, hey, God bless you. Yep. But I thought, you know, excuse my language, this is the only thing – these jerks think I can do is that because I'm an enlisted person that all I can do is go out and do something like that. Yep. And it finally got to the point the day before I retired and a three star asked me the same thing and he got the horns. And I said, let me tell you something, General. I'm coming for the jobs you're going. For. You're going to have to compete against me. 
Of yeah, course, I like it. the look on his face was like, damn, I'm glad this asshole's retiring. You know, like, but the <laughs> point being is, I was not going to get, I, in the military, I refused to allow myself to be put into a box that said, this yeah. is all I could do. I, I constantly wanted to learn. I wanted to get better. I wanted to grow and develop. I wanted more responsibility. Mm-hmm. And then I'm doing the same thing in retirement. My main goals are to get back, and that's to help uh, veterans that are struggling with PTSD uh, and that, uh, and get after this uh, suicide epidemic, help them with employment. But also, I want to be able to make life comfortable for my family. I want to give my wife, who endured 36 years yeah. in the military with me, five different combat deployments. We were apart 11 total years out of the 36 years that I was in. Right. And I That's want to give her the life that she's comfortable with. And, yeah. and I want to have a comfortable life. And again, you know, if you have that kind of attitude, good things are going to happen to you. Yep. But also yep. what's going to happen. And I know you guys are familiar with the urban dictionary. I love the urban dictionary <laughs> and the professional jellops come out. These people that regardless of what you do, if you are trying to strive for excellence in something or trying to do something to make yourself or the people that you have to span of control over better, and you're outshining somebody else, even though you're not trying to, they will immediately get jealous yeah. and look to do professional harm to you. And even in retirement, I see it now where people are criticizing me because I'm staying fit. Mm. You know, I mean, <laughs> people Maybe are coming back. Shape. What's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, they come back to me and say, well, some of us uh, can't PT. And I said, wait a minute. I said, you know, I'm a 100% disabled veteran, okay? Mm. And, you know, I got some medical issues, but I'm not going to let those medical issues define me. Yeah. Just like I'm not going to be stuck in my own museum and fall back on the fact that I was the SEAC. You know? mm. I was absolutely proud to be the SEAC and everything, but now I, I need to continue to do things in this chapter of my life. Yeah. The SEAC was a chapter that's all, of a book that's already been written. This is the next chapter that I'm trying to write that will allow me to continue to give back, uh, give back to my family that has sacrificed so much and be there. And if, and if there's anything I'm trying to do right now is just be, be there when somebody needs me. And so there's at least half a dozen phone calls a day. I feel, or I reach out to people that may be struggling just to let them know I'm there. And, and in the end, all of us that have served in the member in this warrior class, uh, all three of us here know all about this. Um, we have to be there for each other. So that's what I'm trying, trying to do now. Yeah. And, and, you know, when you get out, it's about having bigger goals, you know? And I tell yeah. people all the time, especially yeah. enlisted leaders, don't sell yourself short when you get out and think that the only thing you can do is work at range control or something like that. Again, if people yeah. want to do that, God bless you. But yeah. go out so, and make an impact in the corporate world. And, and you know what? Um, with that being said, like it kind of goes back to like how I always think about when people are joining um, and yeah. everybody that currently serves and join. Like so, and you said your goals. So I always like to say your origin story. Nah. Going like going backwards, like we're gonna go back thirty seven years, thirty six years, thirty five years, depending on when you joined and how you came to me. Like, what made you decide, like, you know what? I think I'm going to go ahead and, and serve. Like, I'm going to go ahead and join. Like, yeah. raise my right hand. And, um, like, after all the movies I didn't seen, all the horror stories I didn't <laughs> heard of, I'm going to still decide to do this. Yeah. Like, what, what got you? Like, what, what, yeah. what got you? So, um, when I was growing up, you know, I grew up in Davenport, Iowa. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I was into athletics and everything, but I wasn't that good at it. And, uh, <laughs> you know, there was guys out of my neighborhood that I grew up in the West End of Davenport, which uh, was a pretty bad neighborhood. But I would see these uh, guys that were a little older than me that would go and join the Army or the Marine Corps or the Air Force, or whatever they joined. And regardless of what service they they all came back with this air of confidence this sinewy muscular look about them because they were fit and everything. And, and they, they had this kind of, uh, you know, aura about them that said, I want some of that. 
Yeah. So I initially joined, you know, to, because I didn't know what I was going to do. You know, here I was 18 years old and uh, I wasn't good at athletics. I wasn't good in school too well. So there was no scholarships coming my way. And I initially joined because I wanted to be like those guys. Okay. And uh, I thought I would do four years and get out. Um, <laughs> but really life changed. <laughs> <laughs> you no. Know? Well, you, yeah. you got married. Here I am 38 years later. But so, you know, I joined in September of 82. I graduated from my, uh, my uh, basic training and uh, my advanced individual training in December. I arrived at my first duty station, Fort Bliss, Texas, on 5 January 1983. Fort Bliss. <laughs> and on the 1st of February, I met a girl named Sandra Jimenez, this cute little uh, Mexican girl, and uh, she's been my wife ever since. Man. But <laughs> we met, and uh, 14 months later, we had our first child, my oldest son, Daniel. Mm -hmm. And life changes when, when it's yeah. just you in the military – You've got plenty of options on whether you need to stay in or get out. For sure. But uh, the minute I got, you know, I got married and now I got a child, I thought, man, I got responsibility now, so I need to yeah. stay in. And, and so I did. And the, the best thing that happened is uh, I got stationed in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, in the 82nd Airborne Division. And I started jumping out of airplanes. <laughs> and I loved it. Absolutely loved it. And then I wanted to continue to grow and develop. And so, uh, you know, I wanted to be an airborne ranger and I went and did it. And I wanted to be a pathfinder and a jump master and all these things. Mm. And I went and did it. Wow. And I, it just, I absolutely love what I, and then being around people in the military, you know, I, I tell people all the time, you know, if you want to see a snapshot of what the United States of America is supposed to be, look in the United States military in terms mm. of, you know, and we've got our challenges in the military, don't get me wrong. Uh, yeah. There are racial inequalities and stuff going on, but I think, uh, you know, our leadership is looking to right the, those ships a little bit. But mm -hmm. when you look at it, at any given time, you could be on a high-performing team that, you know, that are there are whites, there are blacks, there's Asians, uh, there's Islanders, there's Hispanics, and you all come together collectively as a team focused on that one mission. And yeah. when you talk about uh, performing in combat or on a deployment or training other nations forces no other nation in the world does it like we do and which is why you know I, I had a you know not to get off on a tangent but I had a, I, a very good friend of mine uh, that will remain nameless but he is a retired NBA superstar we did a USO tour together and we just hit it off and you know, he posted something on social media that said that the United States is looked at the crown upon by the rest of the world. Nobody wants them to come into their country. And so I countered with, you know, there's 196 nations in the world, and the United States military has troops in 169 of those countries. Mm -hmm. About 300,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guards on the ground worldwide. We've got seven mutual defense treaties. We have NATO. We have ASEAN, we have all these alliances and partnerships we have. And everywhere I went is the SEAC into places like Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Libya, Yemen, Niger, Venezuela, Colombia, uh, all over the Pacific. Everywhere I went, those other nations were saying, we want you here and we thank you all for being here. So my point in all of this is uh, being in the United States military, uh, gives a snapshot of what our country, what the United States of America should be and, and can be uh, when we get this uh, kind of level playing field going uh, where everybody gets an opportunity, everybody gets treated with dignity and respect, and there's no uh, boundaries between race, gender, religion, or any of those other things. Mm -hmm. And I tell, and I'll finish it off with this on this portion, 19 July, 2007. Yesterday was my 13th anniversary of the worst day of my life. And uh, I was surge brigade number four in Iraq. I was the brigade command sergeant major. My boss and I were out on a patrol going to visit troops. And we got hit by an Iranian weapon, an explosive form penetrator that killed uh, one of our guys and severely wounded another. We had a pretty significant firefight there. And I'm in the middle of the street uh, protecting this wounded uh, guy and while 
our medic is doing work on him. And I'm just kind of laying on top of both of them to make sure that they don't take any fire while this guy is trying to, this medic uh, is trying to save the other guy's life. And all of a sudden on the radio, I heard, hey, we are the quick reaction force and we're coming to get you all. I didn't care what race that person was. I didn't care what rank they were. I didn't care what religion they were. I didn't care what gender or whether they were transgender or anything. I just knew that there was an American on the other end of that line that was coming to save my life and everybody else in that patrol out there. Yeah. And that's the way we think in the military. And that's the way we should think across this nation is yeah. that when it comes to helping each other, we shouldn't put any parameters on it other than I've got an American helping. Yeah. So as far as, so, so with that being said, what would you say, like, would you say there was a difference in mentality when you crossed over to what you're doing now? Cause you know, like, I think one of the things we talked about in our last, in our first podcast was, um, you know, me and Roy were recruiters together. And when I first showed up, I was lucky enough to like, they, we, we cohesively became a team in one moment when I was about to miss my goal. And another one of our teammates said, he can have, he can have my person because he needs to make goal. And so in that moment, I was like, man, like we are an actual team. But as you, I'm sure you've heard like in sales and recruiting and stuff like that, um, it can be really hard for those bonds to form. And then sometimes maybe people feel like the other parts of the team may be out to get them. I, I agree wholeheartedly. The more we focus on a team doing something as, a, as opposed to individuals, the better off we'll be. But unfortunately, especially in the recruiting world, it's, you know, what have you done for me lately? <laughs> hey, you, you, you doubled, you guys know what I'm talking about. Yep. You doubled your mission oh, last yeah. month. Yep. What have you done for me this month? You know? So um, what I would say out, outside here, when you talk about, you know, we give you in the military, you're given a task and a purpose. Yeah. You're not given a method and you're kind of given an end state of it. But here's what I want you to do. And here's why I want you to do it. And then we allow you to, you know, the uh, agile and adaptive thinking and being able to figure out how to accomplish that mission, how you would do it. It may not be how I would do it, but the, the method doesn't matter as long as the end state is the same. Yeah. Same. What I've seen in the corporate world, uh, that kind of uh, autonomy sometimes gets frowned upon. And you know how we are. <laughs> Every day you come to work, what are we supposed to do today? All right, let's get it done. And we go and get it done, you know? Yeah. And sometimes what I've seen in the outside world is uh, military members are moving a little bit faster than some folks in corporate America. All good people out there, you yeah. know, I mean, but it's just a little different. And here's why I love the title of your two in your show, Scared Money Don't Make Money, <laughs> okay? What you have to do out here is one, Look at your professional military reputation. What do others yeah. think of you? Yeah. Not as a leader, as a person, as a recruiter or whatever you all have done. And can that professional military reputation translate to a uh, marketable personal brand yeah. out here? Yeah. And I will tell you, if um, – we get institutionalized in the military. And trust me, if you stay almost 40 years. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. You know, you know, we, talk, you know, we talk about that all the time. Yeah. Oh, man. I mean, put us in a box. You put yourself in this little box. <laughs> yeah. And so sometime when you get out, um, you may have scared money because you're so institutionalized. Yeah, and yep. trust me, when you go to work for organizations, we have to submit an invoice to get paid. And then oh, sometimes yeah. you're at the mercy of your, your supervisor, how fast they're putting that uh, invoice in to get payment. Mm -hmm. When we know in the military, the first and 15th of every month, if you ain't getting paid, there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. And, we, and we're going to get it fixed like that. <laughs> Finance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, but oh, so, so when you get out here, <laughs> when you get out here, uh, you can't be scared of money. You've got to be aggressive money. You want to make money out here? you got to have that, that marketable personal brand you got to have the same energy and drive to accomplish missions. Because I'll tell you what, corporate America wants people that are, are inspirational. They provide purpose, motivation, direction, and provide discipline as well when it's needed. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why I, you know, 
scared money doesn't make money out here in the world. And, you know, and, and that's why I love the name of your show. Yeah. yeah, you know what? You 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 kind of hit the nail on the head. Like so, I I've always said, um, being in the military in certain situations, certain circumstances, individuals can get very comfortable, super, very like super like comfortable. very comfortable. And I I've always looked at it in my mind like I can get fired at the drop of a hat. <laughs> um, so I have to I remind always, him he's not going to get fired. Sometimes he's like, yeah. I'm going to get fired. Like they can't well, just, I'm, I'm, they can't just fire you. <laughs> and and, and I, I like that mindset because I've always said, you know what, if I keep it, I will always be prepared when I, when I have to hang it up uh, because I don't, I don't want to get comfortable. And I think sometimes, especially in recruiting, you've already, depending on when you come into recruiting, you lived a comfortable lifestyle mm. and then you come into this, this special duty and it's very uncomfortable. Yep. And some people just don't adapt. Like I've always, I like to see how people react to certain situations and circumstances based off of observation. I always say, you don't have to go through the hard knocks of life to understand what it's all about. So I've seen so many people retire and then they're just like, hmm, what am I going to do next? Yeah. And like, bro, you had 20 years to figure it out. <laughs> but I understand that not everybody think like that. So when did it click to you? Like, you know what? When it's time for me to separate or retire, mm -hmm. what you're going to do? Did you figure it out two months down the line, two years down the line, or five years down the line? So... I will tell you, I've always, as a leader in the military, I always exercise what I call personal healthy fear. And it means that, again, tomorrow, I could, if I don't get a mission accomplished, I could get fired. Or I do not want to disappoint my boss, nor do I want to let the folks that I'm responsible for down. So I've always been focused on, you know, having this little internal healthy fear that says, I got to get better tomorrow. I got to be better tomorrow. I got to show out for my people tomorrow. I got to show out for the leadership. And, and it was all to be that example that people could say, this guy gets it right. I didn't want to, you know, be that person that would stand around and bark a lot of orders and then sit around and watch people execute the mission. I wanted to say, here's what the heck we're going to do. Follow me and I'll show you how we're going to get it done. Or we're going to execute this objective to the top of the mountain here in Afghanistan together or whatever it is. Yeah. And I think, especially out here, you have to have that kind of healthy fear because at any moment, a, an organization could go a different direction and say, Hey, thanks. Yeah. You know, every contract that I've assigned out here has a clause in it, that they can let me go at any time. Mm -hmm. So when they call and want me to do something that I'm a brand ambassador for, I make the time to do it. You know, yeah. I, I still have that fear of if, if I don't do this, then they may look for somebody else to do it and they may end up letting me go. So, um, again, that's just been my attitude for the last ever since probably around 1990. <laughs> I've just had this attitude of this internal healthy fear that says I got to get better tomorrow. I got to yeah. show out. I want to make sure that, you know, the people that are happy, that are paying me now are getting the return on their investment. And yep. so I'm still trying to strive for excellence in everything I do. I don't always get it right. And, uh, you know, I, will, I steadily make mistakes out here, but uh, I learn from them. And the other thing I still do is, you know, I look at other folks, you know, like my co-host on the Ron and John show. Ron only spent, you know, he's a former recruiter too. He only spent a uh, total of maybe eight years in the military. But there's some things because he's been out for 15 years that I look to him for advice on how to get after it out here in the corporate world. And as long as we are humble and, and we execute a little humility in what we're doing and not being tied up on our high horse saying, well, shit, I'm supposed to know everything. I was the C act. You know? yeah. It don't work like that. And, and if you're not humble enough to say, Hey, Roy or Cameron, can you give me some advice on how to get after this? You know, and if, and if, yeah. if can't do that, then you're going to have struggles out here. So I think, uh, Roy, you're spot on. You know, it's uh, you can't get comfortable. When people get into their com comfort zone, uh, they can get complacent. And once they yep. get complacent, 
Yeah. Uh, the next step is lazy. And, <laughs> yep. and, and then, you know, ultimately it can be pink slip um, or marginalization, you know, or your brand just uh, goes south on you. Your personal brand just goes south and, it, and it's not marketable. I was talking about that today, the, my pers- my personal brand, because I, I, ha- I had something happen, and um, I was, uh, Roy's a, so Roy's the one where he always feels like he's going to get fired, so he's always, like, protecting himself. I'm I'm the one where I'm like, I know I have other options, so I'm just going to be out here crazy, because I can do what I want. <laughs> so I usually talk to him about what's going on, like, do you agree with how I handled the situation or was I doing too much? Like that's, and that's why we get along so much. Cause we probably, we talk every single day and um, I had something happen with somebody and they didn't get it. They were like, I don't see what the big deal is. Like I just made these comments in the system. Like if you don't like them, don't read them. And I said, you don't understand because you don't understand how prideful I am in my name. Like in the Cameron Macias name, how prideful I am in the recruiting world. So that's my brand. That's why I care about what was said because that's my brand. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's crazy because, I mean, I, I, to me, that's what I like about the military is because there are so many origin stories for one <laughs> yeah. and so many different experiences that a lot of times, like I tell my guys all the time, like, hey, I'm going to listen. Like, I have to listen to, <laughs> to get that fresh idea because – a lot of times, like I don't want to, I don't want to live in my museum. Every once in a while, yeah. like I'll, I'll make them like, hey, like this is this is Roy's museum. Uh, <laughs> listen to me for for two minutes. Uh, but okay, we're done and talking that's about okay. my museum. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Just like, this, like this, this, this is my museum. But but now I need you to like go ahead and tell me about how you're trying to establish your museum because. How I yes. built my museum in that time yep. is completely different than how you're gonna execute and build your museum now. Yep. And I, I think I'm a I'm an advocate for listening to people that paved the way before us because yeah. there there will always always no matter what will always be something an old head not calling you old but like a, I, I, that's just a term like an old head can like give to a younger person and i think yeah. sometimes in the even in my generation my generation is uh at fault for this we kind of kind of be like no nah, you're you're old you don't know what you're talking about but we fail to realize like hey og been around the block a couple of times That's so right. <laughs> we need to like get something the if fruit, something the fruit is in the pudding <laughs> the <fruit> is, <laughs> what, is there? Like, and, and, and i that's why i appreciate you like speaking to us because you're, you're really coming from a point from a perspective of like, Hey, I've been in the military X yeah. amount of time and I exited at this time frame of my life, mm-hmm. but we can all, no matter who's listening, no matter what can take something from it because yep. we're all going to hang up our hat one day. Oh yeah. That's yeah. right. Yep. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, you're spot on, you know, so we're referencing your museum and uh, showcasing your museum is okay. Yeah. Living in your museum will cause you to get lost in your museum. <laughs> but but the rent's free. Wrong. The rent's free so, in my own museum. <laughs> absolutely. The rent is free. And it's okay to showcase it to people and bring them in. You know, But in the end, if you live in there, yeah. you'll get lost. Yeah. And once yeah. you're lost in your museum, there's no getting out. So, well said, Roy. Absolutely. And... Uh, you know, when, when you talk about uh, the OG, the experience, we, we do a lot of training and education. We lead the world in training and educating non-commissioned and petty officers. I call it our greatest competitive advantage is our NCOs and petty officers because no other nation in the world does that. Mm. But if we don't give experiences yeah. uh, and we don't uh, encourage self-study, self-improvement, Ooh. then... Um, we're not going to have that holistic kind of non-commissioned officer that we want. So all the training and, and education in the world doesn't mean nothing if it's not if it doesn't have a practical application somewhere around the world or in recruiting or wherever we have men and women serving that. Um, if there's not practical application, then that we won't be getting the sets and repetitions needed to continue to build 
that individual and continue to build them for more responsibility uh, at the next uh, rank that they attain out there. So, and, uh, and then in the end, there's got to be an, a self-initiative to do self-study, self-improvement, whether it's college, uh, a, yes. a credentialing or something like that. So what, yep. so, <clears throat> so now that you're in the civilian sector, so those, those same things you just talked about, how are they applying them or how better do you think they could apply them in the civilian world? Cause like, as you, as I'm sure you already know, like a lot of sales teams, they have their own sets of training and things, but yeah. do you think there are lessons that we can bring to them and or vice versa? Is there something you've seen in the civilian sales world where you're like, maybe the military could learn from that? Yeah. So I live, when you talk about leadership, there's a leader, there's an art of leadership and then there's a science of leadership. Yeah. The science of leadership is kind of the technical and tactical skills for whatever task, it, whether it's sales, or whatever it is. Mm. The art of leadership is the intangibles that gets people to uh, better performance, that motivates them, that inspires them and everything. So I kind of live in that art world out here in what I do. As a matter of fact, some of the organizations I work for they start to uh, get me involved in some of this science mm. of the project we're doing. And I'm like, look, I'll get the smart people in here to talk about this. I'll be on the roof <laughs> pulling security. Okay. okay. Look, man. Because I have no <laughs> idea. So I think, and here's what I would say to, to both of you guys and what I'm seeing now the constant skill that translates from military service into the civilian sector in corporate America is the people skill. Yeah. Yes. And so if there's one thing, there's one constant that we as enlisted are always involved in, whether you're in for two years or whether you're in for 38 years, you're in the people business. Yep. And when you get out here, corporate America wants people, wants to hire folks, veterans that are those people kind of folks. Don't get me wrong, our generals and admirals and our senior officers, they're all about vision and strategy and stuff like that which is why they get these high paying jobs. But when you talk about a CEO at Microsoft or Comcast or any of these other organizations, they want somebody, as you referenced earlier, Cameron, that isn't afraid to tell them that the emperor doesn't have any clothes on, you know, and, <laughs> and will give them the ground truth. And it will be in a, a language that is eloquent mm -hmm. to how we kind of grew up as enlisted people, you know? Yeah. I mean, over the years, I mean, <laughs> oh, yeah. When you're a youngster, a young A1C, <laughs> and you're living in a dormitory, the language you use is probably not, uh, you know, G-rated, you know. No. But over time, you learn that the ideas and concepts that you use then, uh, the language that gets after that becomes more PG-rated yep. and uh, acceptable. And then when it gets to the point where you spend a body of work, like 20 years in the military, and now all of a sudden you're out in the corporate world, those kind of skills will translate and you'll be able to continue to do the things that you were doing in the military as far as being a leader. Yeah. It's definitely, yeah. it's definitely important to, I would say in that, in the people person aspect is to seek out people as well that like, so like me, I'm an acquired, I'm an acquired personality, which I've been like, Roy's told me that our other, our other friend has told me that. Um, but They've also said it's allowed them to know how to understand certain people. So like Roy said, he he knows some recruiters who are just like me. And he's like, had I never dealt with you, I wouldn't know how to, 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 to know how to talk to them or interact with them initially. So I definitely think that's a big piece. Too. And the same thing with Roy. Like I had to learn how to interact with him because he doesn't think like me. And so I think that's probably why the military, the people facet is such a... Um, a valuable tool is because of all the different types of personalities that we're dealing with from all over the place on a daily. Well, I've Roy said it best earlier, you know, the most, uh, to be an effective communicator an effective leader, active listening has to be in your repertoire. You know, yeah. you have to be able to sit back and listen to people and absorb. And I will tell you sometimes, especially as the C act, <laughs> and I'm going to go ahead and bust him out right now. You guys remember your former chief mass sergeant of the Air Force, Cody, Jim Cody? Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. He was mm -hmm. seen at a Subaru dealer. <laughs> <laughs> great friend of mine. A great friend of mine, passionate, passionate leader about taking care of airmen. And as a SEAC, 
if, if there was something going on at the DOD level that he didn't like, he would come in and he would just vent to me. Yeah. And I knew then that as loud and, and as, you know, borderline obnoxious he was being, that at that point in time, I just needed to be there so he could vent. And I just needed to listen to him. Yeah. And there was once or twice I would say, okay, Jim, get it off your chest. All right, let's figure out how to get after this. So the point being is some leaders, if somebody came in who was, you know, a subordinate to them and they start acting like that, some leaders would be like, hey, who the heck do you think you're talking to? <laughs> yeah, but I yeah. think you, you you get more because there's been times in my career that I've done that. Somebody walks in and just vents to me and I didn't say one word and they get up and said, hey, thanks for your time and thanks for your advice. And I'm like, I didn't say shit. <laughs> I just sat here and allowed you to vent. And, was, and But the, the bottom line, yeah. <laughs> but that, that person felt better walking out because, and, and that's all about listening and absorbing. And at a later point, that person would come back to me and I'd say, well, here's what I heard. And, you know, here's what my recommendation is. He says, yeah, I'm already getting after that or whatever, you know. And that's, yeah. that's the way Cody was. Yeah. But it was, I was not going to, you know, thwart his passion for looking out for all 300,000 airmen on an issue that, uh, in the end, really didn't make a sense that uh, Congress was doing or Department of Defense was doing that didn't make sense. Uh, like, you know, trying to remove the dual BAH stuff, you know. That, oh, that, that, we that, had a conversation about that when they were talking about that. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, and it didn't make sense. You know, and Cody, really, he was just like, you know, very passionate about it. Mm -hmm. And in the end, we got it right, you know. And uh, it got eliminated out of the National Defense Authorization Act. And last year, they, they didn't even try to entertain it uh, in the defense bill. So, I mean, that's just one thing where a guy's passionate. But for me, it was all about just listening to what he had to say. Yeah. And, and you know what? Like, I think sometimes um, when we always talk about being as leaders, like, we, we fail to listen sometimes. Um, sometimes we, we forget to let people mess up, too. Um, yeah. Like, like right now, like, um, like I work with a lot of people, and like, I'll, like they'll tell me something. And I'm sitting there and I'm listening. I'm like, okay. And like, they're telling me their plan. I'm like, okay. In my mind, I'm like running like down the, running down the treadmill, like, okay, so they gonna mess, they, they gonna mess this up right here. They gonna mess this yeah. up right here. But then in the same breath, like I, I just sit back. I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna let you try it. Like I have to let you try it. And if it, if it works. Yo, we're going to rock with it to the end. But if it don't work, at least now we have something to go back to the table and work with. And yeah, it, it, it took me a while. Like as staff, as staff Sergeant Roy, like I didn't want to give opportunities to try things, especially like in my old career field, working with electricity. Like if you yeah. try something, you mess up. Like <laughs> it's we both not going home. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah. But like I, I, I always say like, in the people business, and, and you said it too, like like I always say, like in especially in our in our profession, recruiting is ninety percent people, which is the art, and ten percent science, which is the paperwork side of it. That's right. Like you you can just look at a checklist, like okay, do I got this? I got that. That ten percent is done. But the ninety percent of interacting and dealing with people, we have to let people figure it out. We gotta let it's like. Like our kids, like, hey, what's happening at school? I got this issue going on. I got to let them figure it out. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, sometimes as leaders, we don't let a lot of our airmen, soldiers, sailors, Marines do that. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, this goes back to if somebody's executing disciplined initiative, even though the plan might be sound a little like, as you described, Roy, you know, in my mind, I'm like, yeah, it's probably going to work. But, hey, they're taking initiative and they want to get after it. I'm not going to work that energy uh, because I don't think the plan will happen. Because, again, like I said before, that may not be the way I would have done it. But if they did it and they accomplished the mission and, uh, and it didn't hurt anybody or we didn't destroy any resources, then, hey, good for them. But, mm -hmm. again, we can't be afraid to allow our, our folks to make mistakes because that's the best way to learn is when you screw something up. And, uh, and now you know, hey, this is what I did wrong. This is yeah. what I think I can do to get it right. Give me another shot. Yeah. No. Yeah, step away for a second. But, um, no, yeah, I think I know that I'm, I'm really big on that, too, is, um, especially so 
when I first came into recruiting, Roy was my trainer. And that was kind of the, one of the things we went through is I, I'm all over the place. Like I'm a squirrel. Like I'm like, I want to save the world this way. I'm going to save this applicant that way. I'm going to put everybody in their mom in the Air Force. And um, I remember he would just laugh at me some days because he would just sit there. He'd be like, all right. And I was like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And then he like, then it, you know, uh, the events would unfold. And at, he'd say, so how'd that go for you? And I'd be like, well, this went this way and this went that way. He's like, okay. It's like, well, that one went about the way I thought it was going to go. This, that one actually turned out. I'm, I'm actually I'm surprised it turned out as well as it did. And yeah. um, that's kind of how we operate now, especially now, you know, because I crossed over to the Air National Guard. And so I definitely, we definitely bounce stuff off of each other now because I still, you know, I still have my active duty mentality drive and information and things like that. And I'm trying to bring that skill set to the Air National Guard over here in California. So I talk to him a lot like, hey, what do you, how do you think this will be received on both ends? Because I do yeah. things that affect both parties. And so um, that, that, you know, and I think probably that's why, that's another reason we started the podcast because it was really like, we talk about this stuff so much, we should just record it. Because I'm sure there's somebody else who feels the exact same way. <laughs> and um, he's my soundboard. So that's, that's really, uh, you got to have that, especially in those situations, like you said, not only as a leader, but as a friend or a follower. You got to have somebody who isn't going to tell you to stop. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, but yeah. That, that, I mean, and for me, so I always, I always mess with them, and I'm always talking about different things. So I came across something the other day, and it kind of outlined the different things that I do personally and professionally. And it was a quote that said, patience is not the ability to wait, but the ability to keep a good attitude while waiting. Yeah. And for me, I honestly went back to those times, especially getting ready for a deployment or something yeah. like that. And you're literally just waiting mm -hmm. and you're patiently waiting. But some of the best moments that I had were like my peers and and. I was working with the Army at the time, was during those times where we were just waiting. And I think now coming into recruit, like I have such a patient mindset because I've dealt, like I've learned so many different things throughout my time, like where people can actually get hurt. Like if I'm in a situation, like nobody's going to get hurt. I'm very, I'm very patient. And to yeah. some people, like, whoa, whoa, why are you not like, we got to hurry up and get this done. Like, hey, bro, like, are they going to die? Well, no. <laughs> are you going to die? <laughs> like, are you going to, like, but did you die? Yeah, like, did you die? <laughs> <laughs> like, it, I mean, I, I'll, like, I, I try to teach people, there's a difference between the sense of urgency and the difference between life, limb, or eyesight. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. And I, I ha how did you deal with, like, the fire, which was, Life limb or eyesight and the fire that was it's a fire, but is it really a fire or is it just like a little piece of toilet paper on fire? Yeah. So this is this is back to a leader. Um so in, in Army Ranger School, they talk to you in the environment there to stop, look, listen, and smell. Okay, the sights and sounds of the battlefield. And it kind of applies to what you do as a leader, stop, you know, look and understand, listen what's going on and, and then decide what you need to do. And, and you hit it on the head. Sometimes you need a sense of urgency. Sometimes time is of the essence. Sometimes not having that sense of urgency can get somebody hurt or killed. But more times than not, that sense of urgency isn't there and it's an opportunity for people to learn and grow. So being patient, and I call it tactical patience at the lower level uh, on the ground is, uh, you know, just letting things happen and then assessing and analyzing how things went afterwards and having an after action review where there's, hey, this is what we did good, this is what we did bad or whatever, you know, but not everything needs to have a violence of action to it to get it accomplished, you know? Yeah. Sometimes yeah. patience is what we need uh, in order to accomplish it. And so this, uh, 
goes back to some of the things that myself and the service senior enlisted were trying to accomplish when I was the CAC. We knew that we could not go to Congress overnight and say, get rid of this, trying to eliminate the old BAH. We had to do background. We had to do oh, analysis. Yeah. We had to collect data. We had to translate that data into actionable information yeah. that shows why we needed to, to do things. And when we did all of that homework, it came back and found out that uh, out of uh, about 83,000 dual military couples were going to get affected, where 66,000 of them were enlisted. And then out of that 66,000, about 50,000 of them were in the ranks of E5 and below. Oh, wow. So who was this going to affect wow. the most? The people yeah. that made the amount of money. Yeah. And it made no sense. Yes. And uh, I mean, if two oh sixes married to each other, losing a BAH, I, I don't think it's going to change your lifestyle. I don't think that. A one C that have children, you know, and one of them lose their BAH, that is a significant event that could cause that family to say one of us is going to have to get out of the military because we can't afford the lifestyle we're in. But we couldn't just do that through emotion and say, "Hey, this is wrong." We had to do the analysis on it. We had to get the backing of the chairman and the secretary of defense behind us to be able to get after that. And in the end, it worked out to our favor because we executed a little patience as we went through it. Even though, you know, we wanted to get after it and everything, we knew we can't go over there half cocked because if, they, if we can't show them why this doesn't make sense, they're going to send us back. Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> with that, because uh, we all, I know we talked earlier about, um, before we got on here, about knowledge and experience. When do you think you kicked into overdrive the, the experience that you have behind you and you use the platform of um, going to college and other yeah. professional enhancement seminars to propel that experience that you, because yeah. I can honestly say for me when I was going for my bachelor's degree in psychology I saw that it just elevated my effectiveness as a yes. fruit like like I tell people all the time like oh, I don't want to go to college I don't want to do this I don't want to do that I'm like look me getting my degree in psychology helped me so much so much like I was learning about like how black black friday is a gimmick and I yeah. was like, wow, like, oh, yeah, blew man. my mind. Many conversations we had and when he got done with the class. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it blew my mind. So how do you feel like that knowledge and that experience helped you go to that table to speak on, on behalf of thousands and thousands of people for dual military? How do you think those two platforms of education helped you? Yeah, so that's a great question, Roy. Um, so when you look, um, in our officer ranks, uh, you know, the Goldwater Nichols Act, uh, was, you know, came out in 1986 and it talked about joint education for officers. Mm -hmm. It talked about officers, uh, were required to get master's degrees and all this yeah. other stuff and to get joint certified and everything. None of the education mm -hmm. on the enlisted side is written into law. It is service policy. And so each service, now don't, don't get me wrong, each of our services has a great professional development model that will uh, educate our non-commissioned officers and petty officers as they go through a body of a career. But none of it mandates that we get college education. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you, um, when, when you, you look at a command team, so let's say a second lieutenant, and a tech sergeant or a master sergeant, that master sergeant's uh, experience greatly outweighs that second lieutenant. But that lieutenant's education generally outweighs that master sergeant. And as life goes up in the ranks, if this NCO isn't gaining that knowledge, like you just described with your psychology degree, uh, to build on your critical thinking skills and your cognitive uh, skills and things like that, that experience on the officer side generally is going to catch up. And at the higher ranks, it's going to surpass. So I kind of first saw this uh, when I became an E9. 
And I knew that in order for me to stay on that kind of level playing field in terms of that cognitive and critical thinking kind of skills, I needed to get further education. I started way too late. God bless you for starting earlier. But I didn't get my bachelor's degree until 2010. And I had 28 years in the military already. Oh, wow. I immediately turned around and got my master's degree in 2015. Mm-hmm. But when you talk about, now I'm, I'm bringing 20 years of experience as an E9 into the SEAC position. But now I, my education, my knowledge, and my experience are on par now with every four and three star that I'm sitting with in the room, except for one thing that my experience is probably outweighing theirs because I'm still going around all over the world and visiting young men and women in places like Finchelik Air Base, Turkey, uh, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, or whatever. Mm. So I think the light finally went off on me too late. I think at about the, I think as, as soon as someone can start building on their civilian education, because our training and education militarily are going to keep us on par, but that civilian part, that self-structured self-development, I think start as soon as we can, uh, because as we continue to move up, we're not trying to become officers. We're trying to become better advisors to officers, yeah. especially at the highest ranks, so that we can be the best that we can do. For sure. Yeah. That, that is, that is I, I like that so much um, that I think we're going to have to, like, slow it down on that <laughs> note because um, – like you, I mean that that is a high note, especially coming from I mean thirty eight years of ex, um, military experience, and and un, and understanding um, the value of education. Sometimes, yeah. like I always, I'll, I always tell people, like, look, you don't have to go to school right after high school, but I am a very big advocate for college education after high school. Um, yeah. So hearing, hearing that, um, that perspective of how it brought so much value to your position, I mean, shh, I, I got to go talk to a couple of people like, look, this is what I heard. <laughs> um, <laughs> this, you want to get out and you, you got to start doing things of this nature. So, honestly, Hey, Roy, um, if I could add, the more we are knowledgeable and the more experience we get, we will make decisions based off of information and facts, the less experience and less knowledge we have, we will make decisions off emotion. Mm. And that's where we can get into a bad place of whatever we're doing with life. If, if I'm informed, because, and why am I informed? Because I've been educated or I have knowledge and I have experience doing it. Uh, but if I don't have that, and because I don't know, my emotions will take over and my temper potentially, and I'll make an emotional decision on something that I truly don't understand. And that's why uh, let's make let's make uh, decisions with what we know and what we've experienced in the past. You know, how many times have you looked at a young recruiter and said, look, dude, I'm telling you, I've got hours upon hours of sets and reps doing this. Brother, I love you, but you're going to go down a road that's going to be failure. But they don't know, you know. And now a good person, someone that is a learning leader, will look at you and say, Roy, Cameron, thank you. Uh, Help me out to get through this. But if someone that is stuck in their own museum or they they will make an emotional decision and say, hey, I got this. And next thing you know, they go out and fail. And instead of being upset at themselves for the failure, they will try to blame others and say, well, you guys should have been more persistent. Come on, dude, if I'm raising the flag saying you're about to go down a road you don't want to go down, that's because I know and I'm experienced at doing this. Yeah. So, you know, next time, listen. <laughs> listen, listen. Yeah. Like, hey, jump man, thank you so yeah. much for that. Like from from the scare money, don't make money uh that's mindset right. because you <laughs> you 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 took your head on uh, a lot of people are scared to get out but uh yep. it sounds like you you got out and you you was running like yep. you was running after that bag and running after your goals dreams and aspirations and 
thank thank you for honestly just taking your time out to talk to two cats that's um that just like talking about yeah. what we talk about, which is randomness. Uh, <laughs> we just be talking. <laughs> hey, be talking. Edward, hey, like I said at the beginning, thank you for this initiative. This is important. You know, too many times we have leaders in the military that aren't approachable, okay? And, uh, and it kind of gives a stigma to our young airmen, soldiers, Marines, uh, sailors, and Coast Guard. But when you, this is the ultimate open door policy right here yeah. For, yeah. for Cameron and Roy. You are saying anybody can come on and listen to your show and, uh, and they could ask questions afterwards, you know, and, and everything. And that's important. And that shows me that your two leaders that have won have a vision and, and that you're going places. And, and I applaud it. And I love the name because I'm telling you, at a certain point, we all want to live comfortably. We all want to be, be able to do the things to live a comfortable life and that for our family. And scared money. Don't make money. Don't, don't, don't make money. Don't, don't make money. <laughs> so for all God you. God bless you both. Yeah. Thank you. Thank hey, you. We appreciate you. And uh, that's a wrap. That's a wrap. <laughs> Hey, good afternoon, folks. John Wayne Troxel here. Just wanted to welcome you to my official SEAC Retire John Wayne Troxel page. Join me for leadership, fitness, and having a lot of fun on this page. God bless you all and stay safe.